We don't even know a gamma ray source is an AGM without multi-wavelength observations. So multi-wavelength observations are absolutely critical to understanding this very important topic in gamma ray astrophysics. So I want to start off with this data sharing idea. This is the critical Fermi starting point. And in order to understand this, I have to take you back in time. Once upon a time, astrophysicists used to treat data sort of the way mythological dragons treated gold. We sat on them, we polished them, we squeezed every result out and only then released data by published papers. Now, in the past, there were very valid reasons for being dragons. Communication was difficult. Multi-wavelength resources were limited. The gamma ray data analysis was time consuming. We used to analyze things by hand, individual photons. Systematic uncertainties were hard to quantify. And certainly we wanted a fair return. Anybody who builds an instrument wants a fair return for the time we invest building it. The term multi-wavelength, in fact, was almost unheard of before the emergence of the World Wide Web in the mid 1990s. I did some studies a while back. I went and looked at ads and looked for papers that included multi-wavelength in the title. Now, if you do that these days, you find dozens of papers that say multi-wavelength. But I went back to 1986. And in the entire year of 1986, there were two papers that mentioned multi-wavelength in the title. So I went back a decade earlier to 1976. And as you might not be surprised, the number of papers in 1976 that had multi-wavelength in the title was zero. So things have changed. You know, the first four things I list here have really changed. Communication is, is now possible, electronic communication. We have lots of multi-wavelength resources. Gamma ray data analysis, thanks to computing, is improved. Systematic uncertainties, which were hard to quantify. We now have good modeling for these. We understand all of these things. The last item, we still want a fair return for the time we invest building instruments. And that remains, but these other reasons for being dragons have largely disappeared. So with this in mind, we go back to the time when we were planning GLAST to be launched. That is before it was named Fermi, it was called GLAST. And the Large Area Telescope collaboration included some dragons who were reluctant to share any data. And these were people who had no experience in doing multi-wavelength astrophysics. They just didn't know. But the collaboration members who had multi-wavelength experience argued the project would be a scientific disaster if we could not fairly share the gamma ray data. NASA headquarters stepped in. NASA was paying a lot of the money for this and they could apply some pressure and they did. They pressured the team into a compromise. The data release would be limited in the first year after launch, allowed checkout and, and uh, verification of, of how things worked. But after that, all the gamma ray data would become public immediately. Turns out this was a good idea because in the first year after launch, we learned a lot about how the LAT worked, things that had not been anticipated before launch. But afterwards, this critical decision to make data public immediately has then been the driver for the Fermi LAT multi-wavelength program. So how is this implemented? The Fermi Science Support Center was set up by NASA. It's the central element in sharing. And I, you know, I show you a, an image of, of the web page that has this. What do you get there? This is where you can get the data. You can get the software to analyze the data. There's a help desk. There's a guest investigator program. There's a users group that provides advice. And press and outreach activities are all handled by the Fermi Science Support Center. 
So this is the way we implement the data sharing. Now, you'll notice, you may have noticed on that slide, there were a couple of links to Fermi blogs. This was an idea that we came up with to share information via blogs. And, and it, I show you an image from one of these about which sources were active in a given week. We thought this information might have been useful for multi-wavelength studies. In practice, almost nobody read the blogs. We haven't updated them in years. You know, when you, you have all this experience, sometimes you learn about things that work and sometimes you learn about things that don't work. Blogs turned out to be one of those that, that weren't such a good idea. We did, however, decide as the Fermi LAT collaboration, remember, remember Fermi is two instruments, the LAT and the GBM. The LAT collaboration, we had a basic agreement. We deliver the gamma ray data. We deliver the software to analyze anyone to analyze the data, we provide documentation for that. We also agreed to provide some higher level data products that would encourage multi-wavelength studies. We said we would provide source catalogs in machine readable form that would enable analysis and plotting. We would provide pulsar timing information. And we said, oh, well, we'll provide light curves daily and weekly for a selected set of about 20 sources, mostly AGN. And these were based on the LAT team's automated science processing. This is a set of, of software that runs automatically as soon as the data become available. The ASP generates this information. It's sent to the Science Support Center and these plots are generated. I show you an example here of one of them. This is the the, the light curve over the history of Fermi for PKS 0538 plus 134. This is one of the original 20. Now, all those red spots you see there are upper limits because we chose those 20 based on what we had seen during the Compton era. And back then, this was an active galactic nucleus that was gamma ray active. Since then, it has not been very active. And this is like those ads you see on television advertising uh, you to buy something. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. But nevertheless, we provided these. So having done that, what did the LAT team decide to do? Here's our basic idea. We take advantage of the fact that Fermi is an all sky monitoring. We see the entire sky typically every three hours. We're gonna use that capability to offer useful information to the multi-wavelength community. We realize the lat data are public. Most astrophysicists don't wanna spend their time learning how to do gamma ray data analysis because it's different from X-ray or optical or radio analysis. Second, by example and by direct communication, we promote the idea to other astrophysicists of making at least some data public in useful formats. Nothing useful here, nothing unique here. It's useful, I hope, but nothing unique. And various other groups were already doing this. The third step is we encourage other scientists to work with us on multi-wavelength and now multi-messenger projects. Not everyone's gonna to choose to do that. And we accept that risk, but we make this offer in the interest of maximizing the scientific return from the Fermi LAT data. We've set up memoranda of understanding with many groups to work on joint projects. Now, I should emphasize here, we didn't do this because we're particularly altruistic. This is really a case of enlightened self-interest. See, Fermi, being funded by NASA every three years has to go through a senior review. We have one coming up next year in which NASA is gonna decide whether or not they continue to fund Fermi or whether they dump it in the ocean. And the more scientific papers and the more presentations at conferences that use Fermi data and Fermi results, the easier it's gonna be for us to convince NASA to keep funding the project. 
So this basic strategy of sharing uh, is based on our interest in getting the maximum science, but also in keeping the project going. So our three applications of these principles then are monitoring pre-planned campaigns and rapid responses to events of interest. All right, monitoring. Well, as I've already said, AGN are highly variable. And one of our goals then is to compare variability patterns. Differences in variability patterns or lack of those shed light on where and how the radiation is produced. What we'd like to do is use analysis tools like this, discrete cross correlation function. They can extract needed information, but only if you have simultaneous or at least contemporaneous data available at multiple wavelengths. So monitoring of AGM without regard to the level of activity provides the data needed to carry out such analysis. Well, we get that automatically with Fermi. And what we wanna do is encourage other groups to do the same thing. But we get this with Fermi. How do you provide this data in a, in a form that's useful to those other groups? We have a number of ways of doing this. We have quick look data. This is our monitored source list. Uh, this uh, goes back to what we originally promised NASA, that we, we would have these 20 sources and we would put out daily and weekly uh, monitoring of these using the automated science processing. We've now expanded this. We add a new source to this list every time the lat daily flux above 100 MeV reaches one times 10 to the minus six. We have now over 180 AGM are part of this list. I show you an example here. PKS 0346 minus 27 was only added in early 2018. Before that, it hadn't been bright enough. It has, however, remained fairly active since then. What you see here in this diagram, and the upper is the entire history from the beginning of the LAT mission, and down below, it's the most recent one year data segment. And you can see not very many red spots. These are actual detections. These light curves are updated daily. Now, these are automated processing. It's not a full likelihood analysis. And so the calibration is not perfect, but it gives a good idea of the activity and it does so daily. So if you have a source you might be interested in monitoring, you can go to the Fermi website and say, oh yes, this is one Fermi has been monitoring. And by the way, its data activity in gamma rays has been pretty solid for the last year. Maybe we'll go ahead and monitor this one. That's the idea. Another way is using aperture photometry light curves. Remember, we have only 180 monitored source light curves. These 30-day light curves are done for all known Fermi lat sources. Energies above 100 MeV based on one degree apertures, no background subtraction, however. But again, you can see the pattern over the entire course of the Fermi mission. And I show you the, the light curve on 30 day intervals uh, for this same AGN that we looked at on the previous slide. And you can see it was basically dead zero for years and years and years, and then suddenly became active. These light curves are updated weekly. Uh, in addition to this, uh, it also produces a power spectrum uh, for all these light curves, any power spectrum between 65 days and the length of the light curve. So this is a, another way of getting an estimate of what activity is taking place on an AGM. A third way is something called the Fermi All-Sky Variability Analysis, FABA. This is photometric analysis of the LAT data. It's done on weekly interviews, intervals. It's done in two energy ranges, 100 to 800 MeV and 800 MeV to 10 GeV. And this is available like, like those others on the Fermi Science Support Center website. Provides a list of flares every week. And the thing is, it is not limited to known sources. What it does is to take the sky as seen in a recent week 
and compare that to a reference gamma ray sky accumulated over several years and look for differences. And therefore, it can indeed detect new flaring sources. It can also generate light curves, photometric analysis for any point in the gamma ray sky. This is once again, the same AGM using the FAVA light curve generator. And if you have a, a source you're interested in, whether or not it's ever been detected by Fermi, you can look using FAVA at the gamma ray light curve for that point in the sky. So all these different ways of doing this. Now, all these, all these methods produce useful information, different methods, different time scales. None, however, produce calibrated quantitative flux values. This is where we've got something new coming. Publication quality Fermi light, light curves, and this is coming soon. Actually, it's something we promised to NASA in the last senior review. This is a full maximum likelihood analysis, including all the backgrounds, all the nearby sources. This is uh, a project led by Daniel Kuczewski. It's going to be publication quality light curves for all the variable sources in the 4FGL data release 2 catalog. There are 1,500 of these. And they're going to come out with time bins of three days, one week, and one month. I show you an example here of a three-day light curve for one of these AGM. And the plan is to update these light curves regularly, making them useful. Quantitative multi-wavelength analysis is going to be possible using these light curves because they are going to be the, the publication quality light curves. And you can extract the data and then construct your own uh, discrete cross-correlation functions with whatever data you might have at other wavelengths. All right, so this is something new. What about time-resolved energy spectrum? Our monitoring data don't include any information about time-resolved energy spectrum. Flux values are not particularly sensitive to the spectral shape. The automated science process does construct a power law spectrum for each source, typically with large error bars because it's over short time intervals, but we know that many LAT sources are not well represented by the functional form. So we've decided not to make those public. Uh, it wouldn't be scientifically valid. The basic issue here is that on short time scales, the LAT data are usually limited by photon counting statistics. So what is needed is a way to define what is a relevant time interval over which you might want to construct an energy spectrum. We're not going to do that. The, the effort is, is just beyond it. But what we do have are ways to define quantitatively those time intervals that might be of interest. And there are a couple of ways of doing this. One, shown on the left, is the Bayesian block method developed by Jeff Scargill. This was actually developed before Fermi launched. Jeff is, however, part of the Fermi LAT team and has emphasized how it can be used for Fermi LAT data. Basically, a Bayesian block is a time interval over which you, you can say, this is not a statistical fluctuation for this flux. And this is where it changes to where it is a significant change. And you can see the Bayesian block shown in blue here uh, breaks down intervals although you can see up and down uh, on this uh, curve beyond the blocks, these are not statistically significant. The Bayesian blocks give you that. A complementary approach developed by Benoit Lott and his colleagues is to use adaptive binning. That is you expand your light curve interval to a long enough time that you get a significant detection. And then you've got something where you have enough statistics then to construct a light curve. Something useful that we provide. All right. Now, so far, what I've talked about is just Fermi-Lat data. 
What about multi-wavelength monitoring? There are lots of groups <clears throat> who've already made monitoring data available for quite a few sources. And I list a bunch of those there. Fermi Project and the Fermi Lat team have been encouraging programs like this. Some of these have been supported by the Fermi Guest Investigator Program. And then if the sources happen to be monitored, the data are readily available when interesting events occur, or if you want to do some analysis where you want the simultaneous data, because remember, you can always get the Fermi Lat data. Now, we obviously do not do multi wavelength monitoring, but what we can do is make links to many of these resources available to anybody who wants it. And I show you here a couple of links uh, to lists of groups that do multi wavelength monitoring or wave, multi wavelength monitoring uh, at particular wavelengths. And so if you find a source you're interested in, this is a way to go to something provided by Fermi that tells you where you might look. Another thing we do to encourage cooperation is it's our policy to make sure we refer to the source of any data, even if the data are public, because we know there have been groups who have made their data public, had their data used, and had no reference to it. That's not fair. It goes back to the idea of getting fair return for your efforts. And the LAT team policy is to make sure that we have uh, at least invite the observers to participate in our papers if they want to, or at least make sure that we have very clear references, uh, web links, references to papers, to people who have done the work. One particularly useful link, especially if you're interested in blazars, is one that Matt Lister, he's with Mojave Radio Monitoring, he has a list of which observatories are monitoring which blazars. And this list is updated regularly and it can be searched. I show you a segment of it. What I did was I listed it by the most heavily monitored AGM. Take a quick look at it for a moment. If you look down this list, you'll see that the most monitored blazars over multi-wavelength are all gamma ray AGM. So if you're working on a blazar, here's a good reference source to go to. All right, what about planned campaigns? After all, monitoring programs cover only a fraction of the known gamma ray AGM and different monitoring efforts cover different sources. So multi-wavelength campaigns on specific sources are a good way to collect the data. The obvious comment here, organizing a multi-wavelength campaign is a lot of work. Starting with deciding on a source and then finding the resources to make the observation. We tried a couple of times as, as LAT collaboration <clears throat> to organize a system. We have one I show you here called our VIP list, our very important project list. And we decided we would, we would single these out as ones that we thought ought to have multi-wavelength campaigns. Turns out this sort of top-down planning didn't turn out to be particularly useful. And the reason is back to this idea that a multi-wavelength campaign is a lot of work. Our experience is that multi-wavelength campaigns are largely driven by individual scientists who have a vested interest in particular source. And this often happens because they have access to observing facilities that can provide essential information. They have some prior experience with these sources and because these sources have some interesting properties. I'll show you an example here. This is work on 4C plus 01.02 and was actually listed on the previous slide. This group has time on the South African Large Telescope, SALT, it can do polarimetry. It's interesting because it's a fairly distant blazar, redshift of 2.1, and has shown significant gamma ray variability in the past. Uh, 
So results were presented just a couple of weeks ago at the Fermi Symposium on this source because this group had chosen to do this. This is the best way to do it. You can't do it top down. Give you some idea of what's involved. The most extensive multi-wavelength campaigns involving gamma rays have been those on Markarian 421 and Markarian 501. Uh, I show you a listing of the participating instruments uh, on one of these campaigns. It's a tremendous effort. And my congratulations go out to David Panek and the other participants uh, for keeping up There's a long running planned campaign on these two AGN. And this is what's involved in this. So what can we do? Well, we can provide support for these planned campaigns. If you go back to the FSSC webpage, you can find a number of links. You can find, for example, the observatory status, our timeline, uh, targets of opportunity, which were possible. Uh, we no longer do those because of the uh, solar array issue we had a couple of years ago. But you can also tell Fermi if you're planning a multi-wavelength campaign. And you can do it confidentially if you want. Basically, the idea is you tell us when you're doing your multi-wavelength campaign, and we can make sure the project operators don't schedule a calibration that would take Fermi offline for a few hours. So this is something that we can do to support these planned campaigns. We can also provide information about individual sources. That is, we've, we've seen a number of these sources and here's a, a link to a list of what we call friends of the sources. These would be the contact persons, people who've worked on these sources on behalf of the Fermi Large Area Telescope Collaboration. These are all the AGN that have been bright enough to have warranted a lab astronomer's telegram. And so if you decide you're interested in one of these, you can go to this link and say, ah, oh, yes, if I want to do a study on PKS 1502 plus 106, the lab person to talk to is Stefano Ciprini. So that's the information that we can provide. Well, third area, rapid response. Now, we view the entire sky. So it's one thing we can do is to alert the multi-wavelength community to interesting activities. That's critical to making the best use of our data. And so we use a variety of ways to report AGN activities. One way is using GCN notices. Now, if you're familiar with GCN, you, you're probably familiar with it in terms of gamma ray bursts but they can also be used to report activity for AGMs. And we have done this, we do this regularly. They're generated automatically, again, using the automated science processing. And it's fairly conservative. What we do is we look at the data for all the monitored sources every day and ask, is today's flux five sigma above the previous two weeks average? And if so, a GCN notice goes out. This is often the fastest way of getting information about a flaring source seen by the Fermi lab. These are also fixed format notices and therefore they are machine readable. So you can set up your software to read one of these and say, ah, yes, it's interesting. I want to point my telescope at it. So it's a useful way to do it. Second approach, we have what we call a flare advocate program. These are volunteer members of the LAT collaboration. They take one week intervals running a set of analysis scripts, primarily written by Dennis Bastieri and Sarah Busson. They run daily and it generates a report about all bright sources seen on both six hours or daily timescales. And then sent to the full team of flare advocates, show you an example of one here, the flare advocates then prepare astronomers telegrams and you know the one that came out today on VLAC activity. Uh, the flare advocate then typically becomes the friend of the source who would follow up on any multi-wavelength campaign.
Well, the flare advocate reports include approximate spectra and lists of gamma rays with energies above 10 GeV, whose rival directions are consistent with locations of sources. Now, if a spectrum is hard enough, or if there are enough gamma rays above 10 GeV of possible interest, we can send an email to the TeV facilities with whom LAT has memoranda of understanding. Here's an example of a recent message. The way we have this set up is the flare advocates generate the report. And so there's no confusion about whether it comes from the Fermi LAT is it, I'm, I'm the one who sends it. And so I have this list of people who received this message. And uh, this is again about BLAC, which has been active for some time. And this goes out and alerts the TEV community. We have something else that we decided to try called the Gamma MW mailing list. Uh, this is a moderated archived mailing list. You have to be uh, a member of it. You have to sign up for it. And the messages are archived and, and you can post messages to it or you can read it. Seemed like a good idea. In fact, it was prompted by a, a multi-wavelength meeting and, and it was actually the group from Veritas that suggested it. And we set this up still exists, but it really has not been extensively used. It's not one of those great ideas. Nevertheless, it, it does still exist. And because it's a moderated list, it avoids the spam that creeps into many mailing lists. Well, what about the future? Well, with the emergence of observatories like the Zwicky Transient Facility and the Vera Rubin Observatory, that's the new name for LSST, they're going to generate vast numbers of transient notices. It's going to be ne necessary to have new systems of data sharing because the, the flood of results are going to overwhelm anything like I've just described. So brokers are needed. Here's a link if you're interested in finding out how these brokers work. We think of transients as primarily dealing with gamma ray bursts, but we know that GCN's already used to distribute information about AGN flares and neutrino alerts. There are two data management systems under development, and they're outlined in the next two slides. These are courtesy of Judy Rackison. First one is called Time Domain Astronomy Coordination Hub, TAC. And you'll see down at the center, this is a brand new version of GCN. And it will allow things to come in from places like ZTF, LSST, and all these other multi-wavelength, multi-messenger resources to send them out. I'm happy to say Scott Bartholomew is still involved. Scott has kept GCN going for many, many years. And the fact that he's involved is some assurance that this new tax system will continue to have the capability that uh, we need. Another one is called SCIMA, Scalable Cyber Infrastructure to Support Multi-Messenger Astrophysics. And this is sponsored by the US National Science Foundation. And it's primarily trying to deal with these huge floods of data from the optical telescopes. Uh, I don't know much about the details. It's really just under development. But what I can tell you is the TAC and SCIMA groups are working to develop compatibility. And this is the future of sharing information. So at this point, I've shown you a whole list of things. How can the system produce results? I want to show you an example that illustrates how a lot of these pieces fit together. It's a familiar result, but the background might be interesting to you. It all started with a GCN circular shown below. This announced a high energy neutrino event seen by the Ice Cube Observatory. And it announced this was a tracked event, which meant it had a pretty good localization. And it had a, a high level of confidence that this was an astrophysical neutrino. They sent out this circular. And you know, people did the usual follow-up. Everybody who's interested in neutrinos goes and looks, and you know, 
number of ATELs and number of GCN circulars appeared, listed some candidate objects or upper limits, nothing was compelling as a counterpart. A few days later, I was in Amsterdam attending a meeting about, of all things, transients. And we received this message from one of our flare advocates, Yasuyuki Tanaka. And he said, oh, we followed up on this. We did an optical observation and found there's this QSO that's brightening and it's in the three FGL catalog. And it's a blazar. Well, it's not one of the monitored sources. So we had to use FAVA to determine its light curve. And we discovered that it's flaring. So what should we do? Should we submit an ATEL? Should we call the TEV people because it has a relatively hard power law index? So you see all these elements, the catalog, FAVA, the ATEL, email, all of these things. And Yasu picked up on it. So next steps. The flare advocates went to work on the ATEL. I sent the message to the TV community. And of course, since I was a meeting at a meeting at Transients, I talked to people at the meeting. There were people there from the TV community, from Swift, from the Ice Cube community. And we put out this ATEL. Yasuyuki was the lead author. Sarah Busson and Dan Kachevsky were involved in this because they were already working on trying to calculate the chance probability of this occurring just at random, having a flaring blazar. We already knew it had brightened in the optical. We already knew it had brightened in the radio. So we sent out this notice. Well, a couple of days later, still at the meeting in Amsterdam, Anna Frankowiak sent me this message. She sent it across the room because she was attending the same meeting. Why don't we get the Fermi Latin Ice Cube teams together and do a joint paper? We have an MOU with Ice Cube. So uh, I then sent off a note to the leaders of the Ice Cube group, inviting them to consider doing a joint paper. And meanwhile, over on the right, you see the Magic team had gotten the message. They had done more observations and they did made a VHE detection of this same blazar. So you put all these pieces together. And the outcome was a multi-messenger paper in science. The US National Science Foundation did a press conference, got extensive press coverage. It was on the cover of science. It really got a lot of, of press. But considering this, this was essentially a three sigma result. But its impact was significant primarily because all of these groups cooperated. If it had come out from just one of these groups, it probably would have gotten buried. But this is the way the system works. And I would say <clears throat> all this planning we did, all these options of, of sharing information, not every time, but all, all in all has worked pretty well. So I put up my summary and emphasize this point at the bottom. Fermi-Lat collaboration continues to work. Fermi is still in operation. You know, ATEL came out today and we look forward to continued cooperative efforts in the CTA era. And I thank you all for listening.